Everybody, this is going to be 5.4, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, or at least the beginning of it in America. Uh, our primary source is from Eli Whitney, the inventor of the cotton gin, who said, One of my primary objects is to form the tools so the tools themselves shall fashion the work and give to every part its just proportion. He also invented uh, replaceable parts. Our objectives, we are going to summarize key developments in the transportation revolution of the 1800s, analyze the rise of industry in the 1800s, and describe some of the leading inventions and industrial developments of the 1800s as well. So let's start with how new technology revolutionizes transportation. So when the United States was brand new, pretty much all of our biggest cities were on the coastline, uh, or they were on a major river. Why? Because waterways were the most reliable way of travel. Uh, best way of moving people and goods was to put it on rivers, oceans, maybe lakes, but moving goods overland was costly, unreliable, and dangerous. The roads were very bad, and they were dirt roads. And when it rained, they tended to turn into mud roads instead. So here are some of the biggest Amer uh, cities in America, both 1820 and 1860. And as you can see, they are, for the most part, along rivers or along the ocean. Now, to make overland travel easier, some states uh, let private companies build up... Um, toll roads. Uh, basically, uh, we, they call them turnpikes, but they are roads where you pay a toll to use these roads, uh, and uh, that helps keep them in uh, service. Many turnpikes, though, found it difficult to make a profit, partially because people would just sort of go around the roads. They would sort of like, they would use the main road, but then they would sort of divert at the last minute to avoid paying the taxes. Um, there was one road, however, funded by the national government called the National Road, and it was paved with uh, crushed up rocks that was more reliable than dirt, and it went from Maryland to Illinois. So here is the National Road, otherwise known as the Cumberland Road, that goes from Cumberland all the way to Vandalia, Illinois, which was the first capital of Illinois. Now, another thing that helped was steamboats, which helped uh, advance, uh, especially helped speed things up. Uh, transportation-wise. So giant steam-powered paddles would push steamboats against the current, which used to be impossible. You used to only be able to go with the current, not against it. Uh, and this meant that uh, a journey of a few months could now be taking a few days if you had the waterway to use it. Uh, the Mississippi was incredibly value valuable for this, uh, but it also was used on the oceans as well. So here is Robert Fulton's first steamboat, the Claremont, Fulton was the first American steamboat manufacturer. Then, in the early 1800s, we also see that people are building canals, these sort of waterways that linked larger bodies of water. And the best known one of these was uh, helped, it was funded by New York State. It was called the Erie Canal. And it connected Lake Erie to uh, the Hudson River. And from the Hudson River, it connected it to the Atlantic Ocean. So this very large canal, over 300 miles long, was huge. Uh, and it cut the cost of shipping. It made New York a center for trade and commerce. Uh, it also increased the value of farms in the West because now they could trade directly with big cities in the East. So here is the Erie Canal going all the way from Lake Erie, uh, following over to on Oneida Lake and all the way down to the Hudson River uh, outside of Albany. And this is what it looked like back in the day. The biggest advancement of the... Uh, Transportation revolution, though, was the locomotive, the trains. Uh, one of the earliest came from England in the 1820s, and they were fast. They uh, did not rely on waterways. Uh, they were cheaper than canals, and it could get you uh, from New York to Detroit in about two days instead of a month, which is what it used to take. So here is what it, a locomotive used to look like back in the day. Now, let's talk about the Industrial Revolution, a big thing over in Europe at this time, but just making it to America. So, one of the biggest changes in American history and in the world was the development of uh, what we might call the, the, the revolution of manufacturing, um, the market revolution, where people started to use technology and manufacturing to build lots of things at once in factories, and this is called the Industrial Revolution, and it changed everything. Uh, one of the first big uses of technology in the Industrial Revolution was the use of steam power to uh, help workers in mills do things like make textiles, making cloth. Because as everyone knows, steam power makes everything much cooler. Anyway, uh, Great Britain had banned the export 
of their technology uh, to make these industrial factories. And they said that skilled workers were not allowed to leave England for America. However, one snuck out anyway, a guy named Samuel Slater, thought of as the, the father of the American Industrial Revolution. Uh, he moved to the United States. He set up a uh, water-powered mill in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, and this led to a series of mills where entire families worked together to make thread. Um, it also uh, became that factories sort of built cities around their factories uh, in order to uh, have a place where the workers could live. So here is Samuel Slater, the founder of the Industrial Revolution in America. Uh, a Boston merchant named Francis Lowell also visited England, saw this sort of uh, industrial revolution going on, and brought the ideas back to America. He opened up a mill in Massachusetts where uh, he not only made thread for textiles, but he made the whole cloth as well. Um, and he got a lot of young single women from uh, farm towns in the neighborhood to, to work in his factory. So a lot of young women are working in these uh what are uh, these factories, uh, they get the name the Lowell Girls because they're working in Lowell's uh, factories. So here are some of the Lowell Girls. And most of them would work for a few years and then uh, go out and get married. It was sort of expected that they would. Uh, now, while they worked for Lowell, they also had to follow very strict rules, though. They lived in boarding houses with very strict rules and with very strong supervision, too. So uh, it was thought that they still had to be tended after women did, even though they were working in factories. Now, the Industrial Revolution changed a lot of stuff. So workers would do small things. Uh, basically, imagine that you're building something like a car. Uh, you know, one worker would do the same thing. He would put the same screw into the same hole day after day after day uh, instead of making the whole car by himself. Uh, this reduced the amount of skill needed to do the jobs and also sped up the process of making this stuff. Um, it also means now that we are not getting up with the sun like we did when we were living on farms. Uh, now we are getting up with alarms and with the clocks. And so you can thank the Industrial Revolution for the fact that you have to be at school by 7.55 every morning. Uh, that is a, an Industrial Revolution idea. It also meant that people were more easily replaceable, uh, and you didn't have to pay them a lot because they weren't doing specialized jobs anymore. And that's going to be an issue that we're going to get to with what are called labor unions. So let's see innovations in industry and agriculture as well. So manufacturers started to make items with interchangeable parts at this time, which meant that, you know, if something broke, uh, this was specifically used in rifles at first. If a piece of your rifle broke, you could replace the piece and you didn't have to replace the entire item. Uh, this idea came from Eli Whitney, who we're going to meet later on. So here is Eli Whitney, 1765 to 1825 from Massachusetts, where he was an inventor and an entrepreneur. Um, he was best known for coming up with interchangeable parts and also for the cotton gin, which made it easy to remove cotton seeds from cotton fluff. Uh, allegedly, he hoped that the gin would uh, decrease the need for enslaved people, but in fact, it did the opposite. It caused a boom in slavery. So here is uh, Eli Whitney's design for an interchangeable parts rifle. Now, it took a while for American manufacturers to sort of get this right. They needed to make molds that wouldn't break. But America really liked the idea and the new innovations, too. Uh, so we see other people kind of running with this idea, like Elias Howe and Isaac Singer, who made sewing machines with interchangeable parts as well. Now, you can thank Eli Whitney, basically, for IKEA's interchangeable parts. Now, uh, we also see the improvement of communication, where in 1837, Samuel Morse uh, created the electric telegraph, where uh, they would set up these wires, and the wires would carry an electrical pulse from one place to another, uh, and uh, you could um, send little dots and dashes over the wires, uh, and people could translate them into letters and into words. It's basically an early form of texting. Uh, and it was a lot faster than just sending a letter. And so by 1860, the nation had over 50,000 miles of telegraphs using uh, Morse code that Samuel Morse uh, invented to uh, deliver these messages very quickly. So here is Samuel F. B. Morse, uh, 1791 to 1872, from Massachusetts, where he was an inventor and a painter. Uh, in fact, he was one of the best painters of the age, considered. Uh, this is his self-portrait from 1812. 
Uh, he also developed the new system of Morse code that uh, helped to spell things out using the telegraph. So this is what a telegraph key used to look like. You would tap it in order to send that little jolt of electricity across the wires. And here's what Morse code looks like. We'll see this more in class. Now, farming and agriculture eventually was revolutionized by all this. Um, and we see that uh, new inventions and new innovations in farming uh, are also appearing. So we see the steel plow invented by John Deere uh, and the mechanical reaper of Cyrus McCormick, meaning that one person could now plow and reap a lot more of their crops on the farm, uh, make it a lot faster. So here is John Deere with steel plow, and here is John Deere today. And here is Cyrus McCormick's Mechanical Reaper. And here is the Mechanical Reaper today. And later on in this chapter, we're going to get to the cotton gin, which was another huge innovation in agriculture.